You thought I was gone, didn't you? Nonsense. As long as there are mysteries of the brain, we will be there to investigate. <laughs> In 1979, Francis Crick wrote an essay titled Thinking About the Brain. In it, he wrote, in spite of the steady accumulation of detailed knowledge, how the human brain works is still profoundly mysterious. He posited that over the coming years, we would undoubtedly accumulate much more data about the brain, but it may not matter, as our entire way of thinking about such problems may be incorrect. He concluded that we lacked a theoretical framework a framework in which we can interpret experimental findings and to which detailed theories can be applied. This is really what Nementa has been working towards since our beginnings. We must understand how this framework for intelligence works, and since the discovery of grid cells, we think we have a much better idea. This episode builds upon ideas presented in previous shows. It's okay if you don't completely understand the temporal memory algorithm, but you really need to understand a few important things about grid cells. First of all, if you haven't seen it, watch this. It explains everything you need to know about grid cells for this episode. If you get grid cells, you should understand that grid cells can represent an enormous amount of space, and each location in space is a sparse distributed representation. Now, grid cells and place cells live in structures called the entorhinal cortex and the hippocampus, respectively. So here is half of your neocortex, half of your brain, minus the cerebellum. I'm gonna pop out this whole old midbrain part of the brain. I'm gonna show you where the entorhinal cortex is. It is right here. And if you pop this open, you can even see the hippocampus, right along inside. You've got two of these, one on either side of your brain. Now, in the neocortex, we think grid cells also exist, and they help create detailed mental maps of every object that you've ever learned. And it works by expanding the tricks that already exist in the entorhinal cortex. Think about the room or the cafe or the outdoor space your body currently inhabits. Everything you can sense right now is your model of reality. Grid cells in the entorhinal cortex are used to represent all space in this model of reality. Your environment could be seen like a reference frame, with you moving within it. Grid cells can represent any location in this space. Your environment is filled with things, and every observable object in your environment has a location. These objects are like features of your environment. Imagine you're in a dark room. You can only sense a couple of feet around you. You can feel shag carpet under your feet, so you know you're probably inside someone's house. But whose house is it? We need to move in order to find out. Look, we found a lamp. Doesn't look familiar, but at least it tells us we're in the type of room that has lamps and shag carpets. But we need more data before we can say where we are for sure. Aha, so we're in a bedroom with a bed and a lamp beside it with shag carpet. Let's keep looking for clues. Hey now, there's, there's a rug with tassels at the end of the bed. And I've only seen that in my Aunt Virginia's bedroom. And we've just identified what room we're in by moving and sensing the features of the room and counting out all the rooms that didn't match the arrangement of features we found. As soon as we sensed enough features in relation to each other, we knew exactly where we were. Now imagine if there were five copies of yourself in the room and they could all move around independently. If they all moved to a different feature and shared their findings, they could identify the room by observing only one feature each. Similar to how grid cells in the entorhinal cortex model your environment, we think that grid cells in the neocortex are modeling objects. Both things have features, which might be a sub-object. Think of the handle on a cup or the rug in Aunt Virginia's room. In the neocortex, the location is not the location of the organism in an environment, but the location of a sensory patch in space. To really dissect this, we need to talk about sensory patches and how they connect to cortical columns. Let's talk about touch and the part of the brain associated with sensory input. Given this widely accepted model, you can imagine what a section of neocortex processing a hand sensory input might look like with sections of cortical columns mapping across the hand. Each one of these cortical columns is modeling space and the location of its associated sensory patch and processing its feed-forward sensory input. As we attend to an object, all cortical columns receiving sensory input model the same object, each with a different position and sensory experience with the object. Remember that touch 
and sight are two very different senses. The retina does a huge amount of processing before sending a signal to your brain, but you can still think of it as representing features at locations, except this sensory patch is more of a projection across space with the sensors at the origin. Each one of these cortical columns has a unique representation of objects because they each get different sensory input through movement. Each column has its own unique experience of every object it's ever taken apart in learning. We believe the number of grid cells that could exist within one layer of a cortical column is enough to represent a very large number of locations. I like to think of this as a universe of space inside your brain. So if you were to learn a new object, you might randomly choose a point within this non-physical universe to start off at and then move your sensors through the object space to learn it. Since the universe is so big, this object is kind of like a lone planet floating in space, light years away from the nearest object. It would be very unlikely that our randomly chosen starting point was anywhere near other objects we've learned. So even though each cortical column models a universe of space, the objects are so far away from each other within that universe that we can treat them as being within their own reference frames. Because grid cells know how to perform path integration in space given movement, we can predict what we will sense as we move our senses through any object's reference frame. So we have a layer of cells in the cortical column that is tracking location of the sensory patch through space. This layer is grouped into grid cell modules, and each has a different properties regarding how it interprets space. As the location updates, a phase shift is applied across all the grid cell modules. Remember, these locations are represented as sparse binary arrays, and we can perform operations on them. So as we move from location A to location B, we can say that A plus some displacement equals B. If we want to know what that displacement is, we can simply solve for the displacement. Once you have a displacement, you can apply it to any other location representation to cause a phase shift. This displacement must come from somewhere, and we think it is probably represented somewhere else in the cortical column, in a set of displacement cells. The idea is simple. The displacement cells represent a movement through space, and when applied to the current grid cell module activations, cause a phase shift and will represent the new location. There are two really important things you can do with these displacement cells in combination with grid cell modules. The first, as I've shown you, you can move through an object's reference frame and associate sensory features with locations. This allows you to learn new objects through movement and recognize objects based upon what you've already learned. Number two, you can associate objects to each other, which turns out to be super important because it enables object composition and behavior. Remember that object reference frames are really all a part of the same huge universe in your brain. So local displacements make sense when associated with sensory movements, but displacements that travel between objects can't be associated with movements anymore. So what could they mean? Well, they can be used to represent the exact position of one object reference frame to another object reference frame. This allows the brain to create representations that can place objects inside other objects. Seriously, think about that. This allows object composition so that any object can be efficiently constructed out of any other objects. A point on an object might have a sensed feature or a displacement that projects another entire object instead of a feature. So moving between object reference frames is just as efficient as moving within an object reference frame. And I didn't even have to use the wormhole analogy. Let's take this displacement idea one step farther. If a displacement can place a sub-object into another object's reference frame, a sequence of displacements could represent an object's behavior. Again, these sequences could be learned and replayed with a temporal memory algorithm as defined in previous shows. There's more, but FCC regulations only allow me to blow your mind once per video. And I may have already broken that law. In the next video, we're finally going to talk about hierarchy when I introduce something we like to call the thousand brains theory. Stay tuned.
still recording. All right, this is it. This is probably as good as it gets right here. This allows the brain to create representations that place an entire object representation inside another object's reference frame. So think about that for a moment. It's a new office. There's a lot of new sounds. I gotta work around. Let's take this displacement idea one step further. Oh boy, okay. I'm recording, all right. Imagine you're in a dark room. I don't want to come back at night. You can only sense a couple feet around you. that are tucked up under your neocortex. <laughs> For example, if you look at this, here's your cortex. Let me show you where those are at. Here's the whole brain here. <laughs> it's not the whole brain. It's not even the whole brain. Okay, let's see how that goes.